Welcome to the Iridex webinar, How Am I Treating Glaucoma During the COVID-19 Pandemic? During, during these difficult times, we wanted to provide a forum to the glaucoma community to discuss and share how they are coping with physician, staff, and patient safety while still providing critical eye care and emergency services, all within the confines of state and government COVID-19 mandates. Tonight, we are very pri privileged to have Dr. Jason Baccarat joining us to discuss this extremely challenging topic. Dr. Baccarat is a glaucoma consultant in Sonoma County, California. He is the founding partner, as well as medical and research director of North Bay Eye Associates Incorporated. He completed his fellowship in glaucoma at the Jules Stein Eye Institute, UCLA Med Center in 1993. He serves on multiple advisory boards and consults for various ophthalmic pharmaceutical and surgical manufacturers. Please help me welcome Dr. Jason Baccarat. I don't hear any applause, but I guess that's the way it goes on electronic. Thank you, Kevin, there you go. Good evening, everybody. Um, I wanna thank all of you for taking the time to be in this virtual meeting uh, with me. I know it's been an unusual and challenging time for all of us, uh, craziness, right? Job furloughing, not seeing patients, being concerned uh, to be a vector of a disease to our patients when that's the reverse of what we want to do is help people, and even concerns for our own health. It's not fun. It's not normal. Uh, and and I, I know all of us commiserate with that. But as a physician, 30 years, close to 30 years doing this now, um, I know it's going to pass. We all know it's going to pass. It's going to leave an unfortunate amount of tragedy in its wake, and it's going to leave us to pick up the pieces, all of us. But throughout it all, um, we need to maintain a steady cool. Talk about this to my folks in my practice all the time. We need to make good decisions for our patients, for our family, for our practices. I accepted to be the moderator on this tonight, that the goal was to pass information between all of us so that we could learn together, we could support each other, and we could help our patients with, um, with ideas, with access to technology. And I think you're gonna hear some of that from Kevin tonight. So I'm gonna jump right in uh, with, uh, with my slides here, if I can. And uh, let's see if I can move them forward here. Keep our fingers crossed. There we go. And, uh, we surely live in a new reality, right? Uh, the American Academy of Ophthalmology has been sending out bulletins to all of us, and they strongly recommended, and this is all over the United States, uh, not just in the areas where shelter in places are, like in Sonoma County, where my practice is, and the Bay Area, but they've recommended to ophthalmologists all over the United States that only urgent or emergent care be delivered so that we don't move uh, assets away from our frontline brethren trying to take care of these people on respirators and in hospital emergency rooms. It's just a crazy, crazy situation. And this includes both office-based care, non-emergent, and surgical care. So this affects all of us, uh, not just those of us that are in the throes of high-density populations. And that, it's been crazy. Uh, I'm still seeing patients in my practice that are medically unstable, or they're high risk, but I am doing just incredible extreme uh, uh, things that I never could imagine I'd be doing two weeks ago. P uh, N95 masks, masks or bandanas on my patients because we don't wanna use up the masks that are available for uh, the docs in the emergency room across the street. There's a variety of face shields available for slit lamps. We've uh, developed our own in the office. Uh, here's an example of one. One of my colleagues in my practice, Mike Sadel, uh, uh, showed me. That now all of our slit lamps have face masks on them between myself and the patient. They're masked. I'm masked. We've done other things, and I'm truly interested to hear what you guys have done, but we are now swabbing our nares with betadine in the morning to try to reduce uh, COVID viral loads uh, in our nares and swabbing at the end of the day. I'm talking about our nares, not the patient's nares. 
we are limiting our conversation like the academy uh, suggests. Uh, we're having very minimal conversation in the room. My, one of my partners is not even talking in the room. He's calling the patient afterwards. We're not having patients sit in our waiting rooms. The patients are waiting in their cars and we're calling them on their cell phone when their examination is ready. In the waiting room, there's no paper goods. Uh, there's no magazines. My wife's upset about that because she used to take the magazines, especially people, home to read. So we don't have anything uh, to try to increase the risk of transmitting the virus to other people in our offices. It's, uh, it's been quite a challenge. Tenometer tips with sterilization techniques have gone to the ump fold. Uh, we're still using alcohol-based cleaning agents uh, in the office. And of course, the hand washing or alcohol-based cleaners for our hands uh, to the point that, that, that our hands are chapped. And then on top of that, we're putting gloves on over that. Um, I, I don't know much more that, that we can do uh, other than going virtual with our examinations. And we've done that too. Uh, we're using some proprietary software on our, on our iPhones for our patients. And we're also using um, Zoom. Uh, the, the, the venue that we're using tonight, we're actually using Zoom for our, for our examination techniques for patients that don't need to be seen in person. Uh, it's hard. It's hard for all of us, and I commiserate with you. Uh, I'm curious, Kev, uh, what have you seen? You, you go around the country. Uh, anything you could jump in there and give some suggestions or, or, or tips? Or are you getting anything uh, on the chat line from, from our colleagues? Yeah, no questions at the moment, but, uh, you know, there have been a variety of different environments that, you know, we've seen obviously changes in and, you know, from actually doing tonometry out into the cars and not even letting the patients get into the clinic, having them triage through the phone or through the Zoom teleconferences, as you said, giving them a time to show up in the parking lot and then um, having them text that they've arrived and then having you text back out to them kind of, you know, what they've been directed to do to go from there. So there's been a plethora of different opportunities to try to limit the amount of exposure, the social distancing. But I think that one of the most difficult kind of times that I'm hearing about is that, you know, the lack of any type of OR time to get for incisional glaucoma procedures um, or that the equipment is not available any longer because they're being housed in ambulatory surgery centers or hospital settings, which have now dedicated all of the staff and resources to more emergent care that are not glaucoma oriented or ophthalmology oriented. So it's, it's, it's all over the map, but people are just trying to do extraordinary things during extraordinary times. Yeah, I, th I think it's our responsibility uh, and, and we all feel that. So what do we do if a patient needs more? Uh, to your point, in my community, Sutter is a huge player, so is Providence, and I'm on staff at both of them, and both of them have shut down their OR to non-emergent cases. And this is an example of a bulletin I got from Sutter. You know, great, beautiful, uh, brand new facility uh, in our community, and uh, they, they've shut down outpatient surgery. Um, Providence, the same thing. I own an a ambulatory surgical center with my, with my associates, and we're completely shut down. Uh, you know, I, I guess we could operate in there, but, you know, we risk, you know, every time we operate, we risk wasting uh, supplies that could be used in another setting. And uh, we're concerned about exposure. So for all of these reasons, uh, we've essentially shut down our, uh, our surgical practices in the ASC setting. I know there are still some, uh, Still, some practices around the United States that are that are going forward with it, but I think the way the the pandemic is uh, playing out, it's it's uh, only a matter of time before it affects everybody. So, so what do we do? You know, Kevin said, well, you know, what do you do if you need more? He said, give me a list of things. You know, I don't want this just to be about our product. Give me a give me a robust list of things, Jason, that you're doing so that we can share it with your colleagues. Uh, during, uh, during this uh, teleconference. So I had to use big font because <laughs> there's not a whole bunch of things out there. I mean, what do we do? You know, most of these people, SLT is not going to get us to where we need to go. SLTs are great 
tool. We all use it. The light study corroborated old studies that were done by Jay Katz and, and other really great glaucoma people on the benefits of SLT. But, you know, usually when people are maxed out on meds, especially the common meds we use today, it's hard to get more with an SLT. SLT is great early on, like the light study showed. It's great to replace a medicine, but it's really just a stopgap when you're maxed out on meds, uh, except for some unusual situations where maybe it gives you a couple of points more. I mean, there's older topical medicines that can sometimes be useful. Probably half the people on this line don't even remember medicines like phosphorine iodide, but surely everybody knows pilocarpine. Uh, and in some situations, particularly in a pigmentary patient uh, that's doing a lot of shedding uh, of, of pigment, that, that might be a reasonable option to try if they could tolerate it. You could use oral diamox. That's a, that's a very powerful uh, get me through situation, situational oral agent. If there's not a concern over allergy or a concern over tolerability, uh, that's surely uh, something that we all keep in our back pockets, especially postoperatively or somebody in the neovascular glaucoma crisis. Uh, I guess you could use oral glycerin in a non-diabetic, but there's just not a lot that we can offer uh, to our patients right now. And that's why I felt really comfortable doing this. You know, I felt, you know, I, I didn't really think this was a great time to do a promotional talk. This is a great tool for right now. This is a great tool for those patients. And I'm just going to share with you two of my patients that over the past two weeks, I've used the Cyclo G6 laser system in to, uh, to get me through. And I know Kevin's going to reiterate this. And I think this is really cool about Iridex before I tell you the two cases and just go over them briefly. But I know that Iridex is going to make this available uh, with demos and loaners to doctors that don't have a unit or don't have access to a unit. Uh, and I think that's really cool that they're going to do that to help patients get through this tough time. And uh, I think that really shows a good commitment. I appreciate that, that, that your company's doing that. But back to, back to the situation at hand, um, you can do this in the office. I, I used it in the office actually for many years. Uh, prior to some reimbursement issues, mainly that, that kind of drove me to do my lasers and my ASC. Uh, it was actually, you know, beneficial to do it in the ASC. I had an anesthesiologist there. But for many years, I, I did these in my office. I actually borrowed one of my colleagues' uh, lasers, Mark Lieberman, who uh, has, been on my, uh, facu has been on faculty at CPMC with me for many, many years and is one of my mentors. And Many of the docs on the line know Mark, and I used to borrow his laser, and, and I loved it. It was such a great utility tool that when the micropulse came out, I, I got my own from my surgical center. But now I've taken it out of the surgical center. I'm just going to share with you a couple of cases. And these are real cases. These are people that, that presented over the past couple of weeks, and it's like, geez, how am I going to manage these people? So the first was a pseudoexfoliator, and it was, it was kind of a complex case, but not really all that complex. It was a 64-year-old Hispanic female. She had pseudoexfoliation and was on Traviprost, uh, was on uh, timolol dorzolamide, and, and had pressures in the 16 to 18 ranges, and had pressures with a Tmax prior up to 24. And so she was kind of perking along, okay, and she developed a new Drance hemorrhage. She showed some progression on the field, which I'll show you in a second, I believe. She had high myopia, and she had an RD in the eye that I'm going to talk to you about. So it's a pseudoxfoliator, history of a retinal detachment, had endolaser, and subsequently had the cataract removed in 2013. We tried some Ropressa, not a bad option. Uh, the most studies show that you can get an extra four out of Ropressa if they tolerate it, no matter how many meds they're on. That was a recent phase four study, but the patient couldn't tolerate it due to hyperemia. Ah. So this is what the exam looked like. The acuity was 20-20 in the eye. She still had good vision in the eye. She was a monovision patient. We're only going to talk about the right eye because that was the eye that I was managing uh, the, a couple of weeks ago now or two weeks ago when she presented like this. She had scarring of the conjunctiva, uh, of course, from her uh, pars plantar vitrectomy. She was pseudophagic 
and pseudo exfoliation on the lens capsule. She comes in, the pressure's 38. She had a Drantz hemorrhage. I think you can see it at around two o'clock in the eye, in the eye that's involved, uh, the upper uh, picture. You can actually see a chorioretinal scar there from her prior retinal detachment. But it was an eye with good vision. Um, and she had obvious cupping in the eye. I think I have some fields. So you can see she's got a pretty big field cut there too. Um, and so I was kind of stuck. I mean, I, I could have sent her down possibly to the teaching hospital, but they're overwhelmed as well uh, where I teach. And I just didn't think that was right. I didn't even know if she could get down to the city. So I used, uh, I used Micropulse. And, and what I'm going to show you here, she was a Hispanic lady. I, I hope you can hear the audio. If you can't, what I want you to notice is the sweeping motion. And uh, Kevin, I'll definitely have you comment afterwards. Uh, but I want to show you my technique in the sweeping motion of how I did that, how I do this. And you'll listen to my scrub tech, uh, if you can hear it, uh, telling me every 10 seconds. If you can't hear it, we're calling out every 10 seconds. And so your, your velocity here is, is one pass every 10 seconds, correct? That's correct. And uh, my uh, technician was just telling the patient to continue to breathe because uh, I could, mm -hmm. my communication with her was uh, not that great. And my, my, the lady that is, was in our, used to be in our ASC, but is now in our, was helping me in a short procedure unit was saying every 10 seconds. And so my velocity was to try to time to that 10 seconds. And Kev, let me, let me go through my technique. And now you've seen probably a hundred surgeons use this. So I, I'm just going to run through my technique, just some bullet points. And I'm going to turn it over to you because uh, you really taught me how to do this. And I know that you've seen some other techniques and some other uh, successes. And I, I surely think your input is so valuable here. Um, I used a retro bulbar here, but I know that you have seen some surgeons use topical successfully. And if you could, uh, could you describe uh, the topical technique that was just recently described at the American Glaucoma Society? for those maybe younger surgeons that aren't comfortable doing a block. Uh, you know, a lot of surgeons that are some of, the, of our younger colleagues haven't really don't do blocks that much. Uh, they, they've done everything in their career topical. Uh, one question who have you seen during this crisis, any shortages of IOP lowering uh, pharmaceuticals or medications? Uh, there's been a problem with shortages on, on generic medications long before this crisis. I think this could exacerbate it, particularly with the fact that so many of these medicines are, are made in China. Uh, China's coming back online. I'm hoping that won't exacerbate the problem, but that's been a longstanding problem. I haven't seen any acute exacerbations. What we did in preparation for a lot of our patients was we uh, wrote three to six month supplies of medicine instead of having to have them fill them monthly. So that was one other technique to reduce the impact on our practice, but um, it could happen. But I think that uh, hopefully with China coming back online, that that won't be the case. So in and any case, have, you can go ahead. I was just going to say, wait, just one other question. Um, sure. You had, the, you had the picture with your patient and yourself both wearing masks and by the, uh, respirator, the respirator on it, I would assume those were N95 masks. Is it required to have an N95 mask on the patient or is just a common surgical mask, you know, will that give you enough coverage? Is it appropriate? Well, I think the best, obviously for viral particle, uh, an N95 ma mask is the best. I uh, wear an N95 mask and um, 
and in actual in actuality, the academy just came out with um, uh, some data that shows that y- you can uh, possibly sterilize them and reuse them, uh, not at your house, but in your in your office. Um, uh, you could do that. The, the patient happened to come in with an N95 mask on. Uh, we don't give patients masks. We just don't have the supply. But we do ask the patient to come in with a mask, and if they don't have a mask, to come in with a bandana. Now, the great thing about this, the great thing about this device, getting back to the P3, the Iridex P3, is that you don't really need a speculum. And many of you have seen these eyes where things are tight. And you're, you're having a hard time moving, moving it around. And I, on the real tight eyes, uh, especially after a block, it can get that way as it pushes the globe forward. Uh, and you'll see the hand piece here in a second. Uh, you could do this without a speculum. And in fact, sometimes it's, it's, it's actually better to do it without a speculum. This is important. And this is what Kevin taught me. And this is how Kevin's trying to standardize this treatment around the United States and around the world you got to couple the probe. Uh, use lidocaine gel or some visco adaptive uh, cellular gel, uh, cellular visc. I love the lidocaine gel because it provides an added layer of anesthesia. And, um, and you got to make sure that the probe's coupled. Kev, I'm going to turn this over to you for a comment on that because I know how important it is. Right. The, the coupling and the use of a viscous liquid interface is a mandatory requirement. So this is not something that, uh, you know, we were using as a kind of lubricating opportunity or to make it safer. It really is founded in an engineering perspective as to how the fiber is made. So that coupling agent is what is giving you the most consistent tissue coupling from the energy to the actual conjunctiva and into the sclera. So it's not you know, optional. This is a mandatory requirement um, with the MicroPulse Pro. That is such a key pearl because uh, I think a lot of times in the past we thought that was just to make, you know, make the probe slide easier on the eye, but it's mandatory for the, for the effect of the laser as well. And please keep that in mind. Uh, this is what I did on that patient. I did 100 seconds total time. That was two sweeps, 50 seconds per sweep at 2,000 milliwatts. So that's five sweeps above, 10 seconds per sweep, and five sweeps below, 10 seconds per sweep. And um, I'm just going to add one more bullet here. If you decide that patient needs a second treatment, you could go back and retreat that patient. There's nothing wrong with doing a second treatment. And um, if you needed it, you could go to 2,500 on your follow-up treatment. Uh, there might be some other cases as you get facile with this device where you want to start with a 2500, but I would suggest starting with 2000 milliwatts and really trying to standardize this procedure. And Kev, I'm going to have you jump in here again. Sure. Um, you know, the power settings, we've given you a range now so that effectively you can treat based on the patient sitting in front of you and your experience with MicroPulse you know, within a range, and that range is between 2,000 and 2,500 milliwatts. And just the difference in total energy delivered between 2,000 and 2,500 milliwatts is only 25%. So there's actually a safety parameter built right in that you're not really kind of increasing the power dramatically just going from 2,000 to 2,500. But we feel that that paradigm gives you the appropriate level to treat each specific patient within, you know, your knowledge base and experience doing the procedure. And I think it's great because, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, it's okay. What I was going to say is the 100 seconds total or the 50 seconds per hemisphere um, and the five sweeps at 10 seconds per sweep, those now are constants. And so, you know, in an effort to basically make sure that we're, all playing by the same parameters and then standardizing it so that now as you optimize your procedure, we'll we'll know exactly what we've done and what we've changed. Those constants stay the same and really the power is the only thing being changed because it's the only absolute pure variable in the treatment uh, parameters. And and that's exactly what I was going to say. I love the fact that we're starting to get some standardization with the procedure because I'll tell you, last year, uh, maybe two years ago, when we got the unit, 
people were just doing everything. And it was really hard to collate the data and try to come up with something that made sense. And the, when, when you brought this forward, it just made so much more sense to me because now we can get data from a lot of different centers and we can really hone in on what, you know, best practices for all of us. So again, let's just conclude on that. The variable is going to be your power. Everything else should stay the same. Correct. I do this. I still av avoid three and nine o'clock, uh, especially in my younger patients, because you, you might, with the long ciliary vessels and nerves, you might get some medriasis. It's very temporary if it does happen. I haven't seen a permanent medriasis, uh, but you can avoid that uh, in many cases just by uh, stopping a little bit short of the three and nine o'clock position. And I have firm contact with the probe at the limbus. I don't back off. I don't push in. If you see stray in the cornea, then you're probably pushing too hard, but it should be a, a, a firm contact. What's great is you don't have to worry with the new probe. With the old probe, if you had firm contact, because of the fiber optic extension, you'd shred the conjunctiva, there'd be big subconjunctival hemorrhages. But as you'll see in a second with this probe, uh, you, you, it's so ergonomically better uh, and designed better that we, we don't have to worry about that. And then postoperatively, I give a drop of atropine. I still give a small subconjunctival dexamethasone injection and a patch. Now, a lot of doctors are not giving the subconjunctival dexamethasone. They're just uh, treating with topical steroid drops. Kev, before I leave this page, any comments? No, I, you know, we, we're just so everybody on the call understands, you know, I wanted to kind of stick more towards the, you know, the COVID-19 and how are we dealing with this as opposed to maybe getting into detailed technique points. So in two weeks, we'll be having another webinar, which is basically just going to be on the revised and updated probe. And it will be specifically about the treatment paradigm and the probe itself. So I just wanted to let Great. everybody know that we're, we're not trying to skip over things. It's just we wanted to stay on topic for what we were, uh, we were speaking about tonight. And then um, I just want to show the probe because it is so nice uh, and ergonomic. And what you can see is the, the wider plate towards the, uh, towards the limbus, which is the reverse of what we're used to, and the smaller end towards the lid. What's nice, and Kevin brought it back to COVID-19, is uh, when you do have these patients right now, uh, the interaction is actually limited. So for this situation, to the point that you raised that, you know, we're trying to interact, I know it sounds crazy, as little as possible with patients right now uh, to reduce viral shedding and us being a vector, you have the patient remove the patch the next morning. They don't need to come back in. So you don't need to see them after the treatment. Just instruct them to start their topical treatment. And um, with this particular procedure, I only use prednisone QID for a week. I tell them to restart their glaucoma drops. Uh, again, they'll talk about different uh, ways to manage this in, in the real world outside of a COVID-19 pandemic and the ability to stop drops right away. But right now, since I'm not seeing them, I tell them to stay on their glaucoma medicines just in case they have a spike and the fact that steroids are being introduced. And then I will have the patient come into the office in one to two weeks. Now, in this patient, I did two weeks just because I'm trying to reduce the interaction. Probably not going to make any changes in a week here anyway. And then you could consider what to do with your glaucoma medicines at that follow-up. Now, theoretically, you could do that follow-up at a car side. You could, you could go out to the car with a tono pen and check their pressure uh, if you didn't even want to have them come into the office. And quite honestly, if they had, a, if, if they had access to an eye care tonometer, they could check their pressure and you could do a phone call follow-up with them because these guys are pretty quiet after the procedure. So you could, you could go that route, but I'm still having them come in with a very short check just so I can look at the eye and check their pressure and then they're out of the office. So it's a very uh, a good tool for that type of situation in, the, uh, in this particular outbreak where we're trying to reduce our interaction with the patients. If that patient does come back though and the pressure's not down yet, don't think that it's a failure 
and you need to send the patient off to a tertiary care medical center that's inundated uh, because, quite honestly, that puts more people at risk and uses more supplies because some of these people can have a late response. And I've seen that many times now with the laser. And sure enough, this lady came in, what's the, 22 days ago. Uh, we did a very quick pressure check, um, a two second look at the slit lamp. There was still some residual steroids. And remember her pressure was 38. So 21 is probably not an ideal pressure for the rest of her life, but you know we could deal with that right now in that particular eye. And, uh, and we left her on her glaucoma meds and, and got her out of the office. So it was a great tool for this situation and got us out of a crunch and didn't, uh, you know, didn't expose anybody else to possible uh, viral shedding and surely didn't waste an OR space. I just uh, want to share one other. Go, go ahead. I'm sorry, Kevin. Yeah, no, the questions are coming. I just want to ask them as they're going. Um, when you're doing the either a micropulse or a G-Pro procedure, are you now wearing a protective face shield as well as a mask? Yes, I'm wearing um, uh, eyewear with a wraparound shield, which, you know, pretty much in your OR you need to do anyway today with a laser. Um, I'm wearing a mask to cover my face. I'm wearing... Um, I don't have any hair, but I'm wearing uh, one of our surgical uh, head uh, gear, uh, gloves, and I would suggest if you have it available, a disposable um, smock of some type that you could just, that, that's paper that you could throw away. Uh, and if you don't have that, uh, then at a minimum, a couple of layers so that you can remove that top layer and, and wash it at the end of the day. No science there, no science there. Uh, just um, uh, trying to learn from my brethren and trying to take the, the appropriate protection for my staff as well. Sure. Have, have you seen any um, conjunctival involvement from a COVID-19 positive patient? Because I've read okay. a couple, you know, interesting articles on that. So about, about two hours ago, the AAO uh, just sent out uh, to all the members uh, some early data, preliminary data from Singapore. And what that data showed was that it's very unusual to get conjunctivitis, but it, that it can happen. The conjunctival, uh, 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 I'm sorry, the tears in those patients that either had conjunctivitis or didn't have conjunctivitis was cultured in that study. And all of you can read this. It's an AO blast and you can download it and read this very important paper. And what that paper showed was that if you did not have conjunctivitis, if you did not have conjunctivitis, you just had upper respiratory tract uh, symptoms, that viral shedding was extremely low. And in most of those patients, not um, measurable, which is great news for us, obviously. And I would suggest you read that paper. Uh, does that mean that it can't happen? Of course not. But in those, I believe it was the first 17 patients that were cultured and looked at, published online right now. Um, it, was, uh, it was good news for us. I, I hope I answered that question. No, absolutely. Were there any other questions, Kevin? Um, you know, one of the issues, and I know that e e reuse of the probes or using probes on multiple pl patients has come up in the past. And I think that, you know, in a viral sense of where we're sitting right now, that's probably not something that I think anybody would recommend. And I think that we really need to kind of stick to the strict one patient, one probe scenario while we're going through this at the moment. So, um, because there's a question on here about, you know, what is the best sterilization for the probe itself? And, you know, the, the probes come sterile from Iridex and they are labeled single disposable use. So, you know, in this outbreak with potentially any type of shedding going on conjunctivally, <clears throat> I think that it's, it's, it should be maintained a mandate of one probe per patient. Kevin, Kevin, I'm going to jump in with a stronger statement. If you are reusing a probe, particularly right now, it's unethical. 
Could you imagine doing that if, if that was your family and that was done? Period. That's a, that's a done deal. I mean, that's, that's insanity at this point. I'll end it with that on that. Let, let me show you one more case. I want to be cognizant of, um, of our colleagues' time, but this is a really, uh, any, any of us can have this case. And this shows why, the, uh, you know, why that box, why the G6 box is, is so, uh, has so much utility for me. Uh, this was the continuous wave G probe that I've used for many years. And um, you could just interchange them. And uh, this is somebody with neovascular glaucoma. This is one of my partner's patients, actually, uh, Bill Bartlett, a comprehensive ophthalmologist with a, a patient that is um, poorly compliant, shows up when she wants, but still has good vision in this eye uh, and, and disappeared for, for a long period of time. She's a diabetic, but otherwise healthy. Comes in on the 16th, vision's 2070, pressure's 57. Cup to disc ratio is 0.9. You could see the iris neovascularization and the angle closed and blood in Schlem's canal. Good pictures we, we got here. And um, uh, just some points. I'm not going to go in deep in depth on how to do this. Many doctors already know how to G, G probe works, but you just got to make sure that you're right up at the border. Um, successive applications. And I would just say 20 applications over three quadrants and um, and that's how I manage it. I, I do use the slow coagulation technique. I would be glad to offline forward this to anybody if they need it. But Doug Gasterlin was the inventor of this from uh, the Washington DC area. And you could easily get this downloaded if you plug in a uh, slow coagulation technique. No difference in the post-operative care, except with the G probe because it is more inflammatory if you do use this uh, you, you probably should leave them on steroids at least that full two weeks. And, um, and I would say uh, you might need to maintain them on steroids longer than the micropulse. So keep that in mind if you're doing a very quick follow-up visit on these patients during the COVID outbreak. And this patient did well. The patient dropped from the 50s to the mid-20s and still has a rare cell. I kept her on steroids, kept all her glaucoma medicines going. So my take homes uh, during this pandemic is be safe, uh, protect yourself. Because if you, if you get this virus, we lost another healthcare provider uh, and, and your staff and your, and your faculty uh, are, are gonna be even more overwhelmed and more inundated and scared. And so uh, they follow our lead as clinicians and they follow our lead surely right now. I really wanna, commend um, our AAO leadership for our probably working 24 hours a day right now trying to help us. Uh, the Iridex G, uh, G6 laser system, it saved, saved my life right there on two patients uh, when I was stuck. And um, like I said, uh, don't take my word for it. Uh, again, I want to commend uh, Iridex for making sure that if you need it, they're going to get, get you the probes. They're going to get you a, a demo. And, and if you have a patient in need, they're going to help you out. And, and, and that will be my last thank you to them for doing that. It's non-onerous. The learning curve is pretty quick. Uh, the, I'm sure the rep will walk you through it if you had any questions, uh, just to make sure that you can use it for your patients. And, and what I love about it with COVID right now is the post-treatment management is really straightforward. You don't need to have them in your office all the time like after a trab or a tube, uh, and you don't have to worry about, you know, that post-operative complication where you're going to have multiple encounters uh, with a patient uh, in this situation. And I won't get into the, to the uh, billing issues and, and the benefits of the, uh, of the procedure from a remunerative standpoint. Suffice it to say, you know, you'll, you'll get paid to use it. And, um, and most important right now is the patient, though. And that's uh, obviously in all our minds. So I'm going to open it up for comments and questions and, uh, and Kevin's comments uh, as well. So we have one, one question back on your neovascular patient. Uh, did you treat them preoperatively um, with anti-VEGF therapy? Ah, great question. So, so this patient's had anti-VEGF um, from the retinologist, hasn't 
had anti-VEGF in some time, but I would have had no problem uh, in the office uh, adding additional anti-VEGF uh, either intracameral, which could reduce the, uh, the vessels in the iris, or uh, intravitreal, uh, she was pseudophagic, and I would have done that. And if you're not comfortable doing that uh, with a, a generic Avastin, you know, the retina specialists like ourselves in most communities are seeing emergent patients. And luckily for us, uh, our colleagues at uh, North Bay Vitro Retinal Group and West Coast Retina in the Bay Area have been just super gracious about uh, being there for, for, our, for our needs for these type of patients. Excellent. Um, on your on the slide that you have up right now, uh, reimbursement wise on the CPT code, um, if you do in office treatments, there's actually a modifier for treatment in office. So there is a very small facility fee that uh, you can apply for if you do in office treatments instead of ASC or hospital settings. So just to let you know. Yeah, and that was something you taught me today. I didn't know that. So you can at least recoup for some of the, you know, the medicines that you have to open because we've been giving these patients samples, right? We're not sending them to a, a pharmacy and hoping that the pharmacy is going to get them their medicines um, and ending up with the patient having to come back for another visit. So we've just been giving them samples. Uh, so that's, that's good. That helps with some of the cost there. Yeah. Um, could I ask you to share your or uh, relinquish the screen for a second? I just have two slides I do want to show. Um, All right, now you're asking me to do something. I don't want to mess it up. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the biggest – I'm going to go with the stop share button. I almost there messed it up. I almost hit escape. Did that, did that fix it for you? Perfect. Okay. Um, I just wanted to show this slide on disinfectant recommendations for the laser platform, the laser foot switch, and, again, kind of just highlight the one delivery device per patient. But isopropyl alcohol or alcohol greater than 70% with a mild detergent is basically what we recommend to clean um, the laser platform as well as the laser foot switch. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. Obviously, you want to unplug all of these before you start doing anything and don't remove any of the covers. But this is just a way that you can ensure between patient and patient that we're, you know, going per protocol here and trying to be as minimalistic in terms of spreading this COVID virus. Um, and then the other point is, you know, Iridex kind of went under a large undertaking as the COVID-19 uh, virus hit. And we have in California a kind of skeleton crew that's still working at Iridex, so the customer service and clinical support number is still being manned. So if you have clinical questions, concerns, or any questions that you'd like to ask, there are people at the phone still answering. We have established a virtual training and clinical site uh, within the Iridex webpage, so uh, www.iridex.com backslash training. Uh, and this is a virtual training environment with tutorials and all of our slide decks, information, our bibliographies in terms of publications, posters, uh, and abstracts. Uh, so basically everything that you could ever want to go through if you're in a situation where you need to provide the treatment, but, you know, in a no travel zone scenario, you could at least get through one treatment by going there and going through all of these uh, scenarios. And then last but not least, our local field teams are still available for clinical support. So the area sales managers and clinical application specialists are still working, although they can't travel. Uh, we still can support you clinically for any questions, concerns, uh, and we've even done FaceTime clinical support for live surgeries as well, but, you know, through telephone, video conferencing, and FaceTime, we've been able to actually support and proctor cases from the field. So, you know, again, extraordinary times require extraordinary efforts, and we've basically done just about everything we can to continue to be able to support our clinicians and clinical partners in the field, you know, during this kind of tumultuous situation. So I just wanted to uh, make that aware. And as Dr. Backrat mentioned, all of our area sales managers do have demo lasers. Uh, for those who can travel, uh, you know, we definitely can provide lasers to clinicians who don't have ask access or if their laser is involved in a hospital or an ASC that's shut down, 
um, you know, give us a call and, you know, we'll do everything that we can to provide where we can in this kind of time of need. So those were the only two things that I really wanted to talk about. Greatly appreciate that. That, that is uh, saying a lot, Kevin, and uh, all the help we can get right now. Uh, these are uh, troubled times and, and unknown, unknown waters for all of us. And uh, we appreciate Iridex's support. And, uh, you know, I really want to thank my colleagues for being on the, on the line tonight. So does anybody have any last minute comments or, or questions or anything that, that we should go over right now while we have, I don't know, many, many ophthalmologists on this call right now? And if not, um, I'll just say thank you to everybody. Yeah, no, we have one question for a neovascular glaucoma patient. If it's not previously treated with, you know, anti-VEGF therapy, um, the patient after the cyclog 6 treatment, can they suffer an increase of the IOP? Uh, not only that, they, they surely could get a spike, uh, but they also are probably more predisposed to get a high FEMA. So I think if it, if at all possible, uh, even if it was just generic Avastin, which is really inexpensive, uh, if you could um, uh, give them some Avastin if you were comfortable, uh, either, like I said, even intracameral, obviously intravitreal is better. Uh, but if you could give them some Avastin and uh, treat, uh, I think that you're going to have a much uh, better result. Now, if you give the Avastin, you may have to tap the eye, which is a little hairy when the IOP 60, uh, you, you know, there's a risk that you can get a suprachoidal hemorrhage. So every move that you do uh, has a risk. Um, and so my, my, my inclination would be to um, uh, tap it down a little bit if you were going to give uh, uh, anti-veg. Uh, luckily, this patient had anti-veg on board already. Very good. Um, you know, how about any other extraordinary actions that you've taken, you know, kind of amid the COVID-19, you know, within the practice, you know, safety-wise, yeah, patient-wise? I'll tell you one. I'll tell you one. This is a bizarre one. We have isolated ourselves. We have four offices and many technicians. And um, I only Zoom chat with my, my associates. We, we try not to be in the same office because if one of us goes down mm. and we're in proximity to the other, well, geez, we lost the other doctor for 12 weeks. And not only that, we've isolated our technical staff because if we lose our technical staff, geez, we're really uh, up the creek without a paddle. So we split up our technical staff. We split up our doctors. And if you only have one office, you may only have a doctor come in a day just so that you're not in the office with that doctor. And then on top of that, we split up our administrative team. Uh, we have an administrative office where we have our billers and coders and our, uh, our, our chief operating officer of our business. And we sent all our coders home so that if one goes down, uh, not that we're generating that much revenue right now, but the trickle of revenue that's coming in, um, as my grandfather used to say, how far can you squeeze a nickel? Uh, that trickle of revenue coming in, uh, you know, that we have it. Because if all our coders and billers uh, go out, uh, then, then we're screwed on, on the financial front. So we have each one of them doing their billing from their house. We had our IT guy set them up online, pain in the butt. Uh, but we've tried to isolate ourselves as much as possible. So um, how are the patients able to tolerate retrobulbar block without sedation in the office? You know, I've been, I've been given retrobulbar blocks without sedation for 30 years. Um, I put some topical in their eye. Uh, I make sure they continue to breathe while I'm giving them the block. Uh, I'm, fat, I'm facile at it from doing many of them. Uh, and uh, it's been not an issue. I don't over block. I give about four cc's uh, in, in, in the cone and then about a cc coming out. And uh, I haven't had any issues with that at all. I use a, a retrobulbar needle, a disposable one from Eagle, no problem. Be very careful, be very careful, right? You, you don't wanna cause a needle stick right now with a potentially COVID positive or any patient, but ultra careful. Once you do that block, 
don't hand that needle off to your tech. Only you should handle that needle. It should go right into a sharps box. Very good. Um, how about betadine in urinaries? What about it? It's a bizarre thing. But my partner uh, told me that this is the UCSF protocol. Uh, it did not feel that comfortable, but theoretically, uh, I guess it could reduce viral load uh, in your nares. And so I just, uh, you know, have the lollipop type uh, betadine. I put it in my nose in the morning. It looks kind of funny when you put the mask on when you breathe because it looks like you're, <laughs> you have a little bit of a bloody nose, but who cares right now? Um, we have one question about uh, experience in treating. Oh, one last thing. One oh, last sure. thing. Uh, I, um, before I uh, go to my kitchen, my normal move when I get to my house is to rush to the kitchen and eat everything I'm not supposed to. Uh, but my move now is to shed my clothes. Uh, yeah, there's no, nothing exciting about it. To shed my clothes when I walk in the house, uh, even the dog runs away. And, uh, and I put them right in the washing machine uh, and uh, shower before I go into the kitchen. I have to ask another question, even if there's not one, just to remove that image from my mind for the next <laughs> 10 minutes. So. Um, so your experience with Micropulse and low tension glaucoma. Okay, so just to you know, flip back on the switch with uh, with uh, micropulse in in low tension glaucoma, it's been a win. You know, it's been like adding another medicine. It's not like doing a trabeculectomy. So if your goal is to get the pressure into the single digits, you're not going to get it there with micropulse because remember, you're not bypassing the episcleral venous system. So from a safety standpoint, it's wonderful. And what I really like with the new probe is that you're not shredding the conjunctiva. So that if you have to go in and do a trabeculectomy, uh, you didn't damage the tissue that you're going to be working on or increase cytokine activation. So I think it's a, a great option. And if you're down in the 16, 17 range and you're going to be happy moving at a couple of points, I think it's a great tool. If your goal is to get below episcleral venous pressure, you're looking at a filtration surgery. Well, at the moment, there are no more questions, and we're coming right up on an hour. Um, I do want to let everyone know that this is being recorded, and we will have it up on our YouTube Iridex page, so you can watch it at your leisure again if you've missed anything or any of the paradigms in terms of treatment. Um, they'll be there for you. Uh, and again, I wanted to remind everyone that in two weeks, we'll have a, you know, revised and updated actual webinar that's going to basically focus on all of the engineering perspectives of what we've done, um, the paradigms in terms of treatment, and kind of moving forward with that uh, revised and updated probe. But I'd really like to thank Dr. Baccarat. This was a great uh, webinar. I think a lot of really useful information for what we're doing and what we're faced with right now in terms of challenges came out of this. So if anybody doesn't have any other questions, we'll be ending the webinar, and I'd like to thank all of you uh, for your participation. And again, remember that, you know, all of the Iridex representatives are still there clinically for you. So if you need anything, please reach out to us and we're more than happy to uh, take care of that for you. So be safe, everybody. Be safe. God bless. Yes, the same. Thank you. And uh, that ends the Iridex webinar for this evening. Thanks, Kev.